I've just started the recording. Okay, the recording is on. Let's um, take a moment to pray and then we'll get started and hopefully others will be able to join the class. Okay. Um, let's uh, pray together. Can I ask, uh, whom should I ask? Rebeka, Rebeka uh, Mahato. Okay, Rebeka, can you pray a quick prayer for all of us in the class as we start? Hmm. Not sure Rebecca's heard us. Um, okay. Robert, go ahead, please. Father, we come to the throne of grace, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. As we are going to learn about the topics, Lord, we are learning about your word, Lord, that it should be used for the kingdom expansion, and whatever we are learning, it should be an add-on, and should be used for kingdom expansion, for the gospel sharing, Lord, thank you for this day you have given us, thank you for the new month you have given us, Lord, you have brought us through the second day of this month, Lord, thank you for all the blessings you have given us, Lord, as we will be learning, Lord, we thank you for the privileges you have given us, the blessings you have given, Lord, we thank you for the pastor, and thank you for all the students, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Said. All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for connecting to class. Appreciate everyone joining. So we have been journeying through this study on our identity in Christ. And uh, today may be our last set of lectures. Let's see. Uh, we may be able to finish the final lesson on um, living the in Christ life. How do we live out of our identity? So that's the plan for today. I uh, just want to talk a little bit about that and uh, we may be able to finish it. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up next week for sure. So, so far in this course on our identity in Christ, we have, uh, and we will do a quick review as well before we finish. Uh, we have uh, journeyed through the scriptures, primarily the epistles, looking at uh, what the Apostle Paul, primarily the Apostle Paul shared on who we are in Christ. And so we traced, or we have been tracing uh, key phrases like in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in him, in whom, in the Lord, through him, and so on. And in relation to, to the, sorry, in relation to the believer, of course. So all of this uh, we put together and then we can understand who the believer is in Jesus. What is our spiritual identity and what is the our spiritual inheritance and uh, uh, and, and so this is a reality in the spiritual realm. And so we need to uh, understand this, receive a revelation of it. And then, of course, uh, the, the last lesson today, which we're going to talk about is, how do we live out of that? Uh, it is important to have the revelation. It is important to have that spiritual understanding of our identity and our inheritance in Christ. But it, it is also important to learn how to live out of that in everyday life, in day-to-day -day life, in all the things that we face. You know, there will be uh, different situations and we have to learn to live out of our identity. So in view of that, so that's, the, that's what we are looking at today. So in view of that, I just want to you know, take us through uh, several insights that will help us. So that's what we're going to look at in this final chapter on living the in Christ life. So let's go to the notes. Okay, living the in Christ life. The first thought I wanna share with us is that we live out of what has been completed. 
and we said this in the very beginning, right, that uh, the way God works is he completes the work in the spiritual realm. And then he tells us to live out of that in the natural, which is the realm in which you and I are living. So we know the key scriptures that because we are in Christ, we are a new creation. So we it's done. All things have passed away. All things have become new. All things are of God. So that's a work that's been completed. It's done. He's made us new creation. And yet, uh, in everyday life, we have to learn to live out of that. And that's what we're trying to answer. And the first thing I, I want us to understand is to live out of what has been completed. And one way of uh, communicating that is in this phrase, we are born from above to live from above. So we know in John chapter 3, verse 1 to 13, and I'm not going over this passage because it's, it's familiar for all of us, um, that we have been born again. We have been born into the kingdom of God. We have been born of the, the word of God and the spirit of God. Now, when we are born again, literally that phrase means to be born from above. That's born from heaven. That means we have received life from God. We have received life from up, above, from heaven. So here we are in this natural world, but we have life from above. We have been born from above. And so we have to live in this world out of the life that we have received from above. So we are born from above to live from above. I think this in verse 13 of John 3, let's read that particular verse, John 3 and verse 13. Could somebody please read that for us? John 3 verse 13 is a very interesting verse of how Jesus um, speaks of himself. John 3 verse 13, could somebody read it loud for us, please? Jesus had come down from heaven was in his earthly body. Uh, what is the description? Uh, in the oh, no, no, no. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, I just want us to read the verse. Sorry. Um, uh, the verse, the John 3, 13 scripture verse. Sorry. No one has ascended to heaven but he who... John 3, verse 13. All right, let me read it. Um, oh, somebody... I'll read. Okay, go ahead. No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Okay. So just a, an interesting insight here. What Jesus is saying is, no one has gone into heaven, but the one who came from heaven. That is the son of man. So he's talking about himself. And then the last part, who is in heaven? Who is in heaven? Notice that. He's, he, he, you know, he, uh, and, I, and I understand that some manuscripts may om omit that last part, but it is found in majority of the manuscripts. And it says there, who is in heaven? That means he's come from heaven. He is going to go back there. But at this time, he's on the earth because he's talking to Nicodemus and the people. And he's saying, right now, he is in heaven. So he's here on earth, but he's also there. And that's just one place where you find that. But in many other places we find in scripture where Jesus, uh, you know, recognizes that, that he is on earth, but he's also connected with the Father. He's intimately one with the Father. Right? So I'm just giving... A few references here. And Jesus tells them, you are from beneath, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So he is here on earth, but at the same time he's saying, I'm from that realm. Uh, uh, you are in this world, and he's living in this world, but he's yet from a realm that's outside of this world. So we know that, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, he... Uh, he was living from that place of union with the Father, right? So 
this is what I want to, you know, impress on our hearts very, at the very beginning is uh, we, we live out of the spiritual into the natural. That's we live from above. We've been born from above to live from above. We live out of the spiritual into the natural. We live out of the heavenly into the earthly. Right? So that's how we're going to learn to live this life that we have in Christ. Right? And just as, uh, yeah, so let's say this now, the, the spiritual and natural life of the believer. Right? So let's try to understand this whole aspect of, you know, God has completed things in the spirit and he called us to live out of that in the natural. Right? We mentioned this earlier in this study that there are several, uh, you know, uh, dichotomies, so to speak, in scripture in relation to the life of the believer. Because you'll find the scripture saying, you are complete, but yet you're a work in progress. Right? And I've just given the scriptures here, the references. So we are complete, but yet we are being changed. You know, So if we are complete, why do we need to be changed? That's because that completed, completed is in the spiritual and in the natural. We are being changed into what we have already been completed. So the work is completed in the spirit and in the natural we're being changed into that same image. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an apparent dichotomy. Let's understand it. So we are perfected yet being perfected. You know. So we'll find Hebrews 10, 14, we have been perfected. And then it says we are being perfected. That means the work is still going on. We are sanctified and yet being sanctified. So in the spiritual, it's done. In the natural, I'm living out of that and I'm growing into it, right? I am being sanctified. We are hidden, yet visible. The Bible says we are hidden in Christ. And yet the Bible says we are naked and nothing is hidden from God. So both are true. My life is hidden with Christ in God. And yet everything is open before God. We are new creation, yet we are being renewed. You know, so he says, you are a new creation. The work is done, old is gone. Yet we are being renewed in our knowledge and into the knowledge of the Lord. We are righteous, but yet we are repentant. That means, uh, you know, a, a righteous man really doesn't need to repent because he's already righteous. But the Bible tells us to do both. We are righteous, yet when we sin, we are repentant. The same thing here. We have been raised to new with new life, and yet we have to be crucified. So we have new life in our spirit, and yet the body, the flesh, has to be crucified. We are possessing, and yet we are pressing in. So on the one hand, we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, and yet on the other side, we are pressing in to possess our blessing. We are resting, yet laboring. You know, so this is very interesting. We have entered into a rest where we've ceased from our works. And yet we work to serve the Lord. We work out our salvation. We labor in prayer. We wrestle against the enemy. We work our faith and so on. So both are true in the Christian life. And so um, uh, you will see the first aspect is the spiritual aspect. The second is what's happening in the natural. Right. So in the spiritual way complete. And the natural work is in progress. And the spiritual way are perfected. Natural way are being perfected. And so on. So the key is, we, we must understand, in the spiritual work is done, but in the natural, I'm living out of that. And I am journeying into it. Right? So I'm not striving for it in the sense, because God has already done it for you and me. We are living out of that. I am sanctified. Therefore, I live sanctified. You know, we're not trying to become sanctified. He's already made us sanctified. But because we are sanctified, we live sanctified. So why don't we engage with sin? Why don't we, you know, do the wrong things? Well, you are holy. So when you know that you are holy, then you say, look, 
those things are not befitting a person who is holy. I want to stay away from it. I, I want to live according to what God has already made me to be, which is holiness in Christ. Right? So I'm not trying to become holy. I am holy. Therefore, I live holy. And, uh, and then I'm journeying into that holiness in everyday life. So that's how we are supposed we should live, right? We should live out of the spiritual into the natural. So to live from above is to know what God has already completed for us in the spirit and to work with him to live out of that in everyday life. And there is so much power in, in living from above because we're living out of the work that God has done for us and we are just journeying into it. And that's the key. This is the way the believer is supposed to live. We live from above to the th in the things below. We live from the spiritual into the natural, from the heavenly into the earthly. How do we do it practically? Practically, how does it happen? Well, the first thing is we must learn to renew our minds. Right? Now, many of us understand this concept of renewing our mind, and I'm just going to mention this uh, in, 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 in a brief manner. You, you, you will have a full course on inner wholeness in your second year, where you, you know, we, we will talk a lot about the wholeness of the inner person, the mind, and so on. But we are focusing now on just renewing the mind. And I want us to see how important it is to renew our mind in order to live as new creation, right? Let's read Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. We can read this off from the notes, please. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. Could somebody read that for us? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22. That you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. 23 and he and be renewed in the spirit of your mind 24 and that you put the new man which was created according to god in true righteousness and holiness man thank you so he says put off put on right so here's the change right we're getting rid of any conduct that is related to the old man. So the old man is gone, right? The old man is gone. And we are new creatures in Christ, right? But the conduct has to match. The conduct, that is the way we live, has to match up to who we are on the inside. Right? On the inside, the old man is gone. You are a new man, a new person. But the conduct has to change. How is the conduct going to change? That means the way we live. We have to be renewed, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So that word spirit there, it's not talking about the human spirit. He's just saying, be renewed in the essence, the very core, the very life of your mind. Be renewed, or you can just say, be renewed in your mind. So for the believer to see a change in their conduct that matches up to the new man, which they have become in Christ, the key is... Be renewed in your mind. Be renewed in your mind. The new man is created in the image of God in true righteousness and holiness. So the new man inside us is righteous and holy and is in the image of God. But now our conduct has to show that. You know, how do we show it? Well, what, what's needed to show that? Well, we need to renew, be renewed in the spirit of our mind. So so the key here in living out of the new man is to renew our mind. That's the key. See that we see this again in Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is again a very familiar passage of scripture to us. Um, Paul says, you know, brethren, I'm uh, requesting you with the compassion of God present your body a living sacrifice that's acceptable to God and don't be conformed to this world so the old man was was the old lifestyle was one that was conformed to the world but he says be transformed in other words uh, 
be completely changed in the way you live. But how is it going to be possible? By the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. So once again, this change, this transformation in the way we live is telling us it's going to be possible by the renewing of our mind. And now many of you are familiar that this word transformed literally is, uh, is the word metamorpho, or in the English we have the word metamorphosis. That means it's a complete change, a complete change. It's like the caterpillar and the butterfly. So it is very clear in scripture that the transformation happens through a process of renewing of our mind. So if a believer does not renew their mind, they are a new creation on the inside, but the outside will still show behavior that is related to the old man, that is related to the past life. That's what he said, because then people cannot see what God has done in the person's life, that he's become a new man and has changed. Right? So we have to renew our mind so that you know uh, that there's a transformation in our conduct or the way we live the renewing of our mind is simply to have a change in the way of thinking reasoning perspectives a renewal or a re renovation or a complete trans change in our way of thinking and uh, the, one of the best ways to explain this is to uh, look at isaiah 55 7 through 9 which i think we have done before Isaiah 55, 7 through 9, where God is telling us, oh, somebody could read this for us, please. Isaiah 55, 7 through 9. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 7 to 9. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, what is God saying? We must forsake, we must forsake, or let go of our way and our thoughts. Right? So it says, you let go, your ways, your thoughts, and you return to the Lord. I mean, you come to the Lord. And the implication there is, you come to the Lord, you let go of your ways and your thoughts, you come to the Lord, and you embrace God's thoughts and God's ways. Right? So we let go of our thoughts, of our ways and our thoughts. We come to the Lord, come to Him, and then we embrace His thoughts, His ways, and his thoughts. So, and, and if you read this extended passage, verse 10 and 11 talks about, you know, the word of God coming forth and uh, not returning to him void. So the word of God is God communicating his ways and his thoughts to us. And so this illustrates the renewing of our mind. We are letting go of our ways and our thoughts and taking on the thoughts and the ways of God, the ways and thoughts of God. So, you know, uh, practically, if you just want to think about practical scenarios, when you're faced with a scenario or situation, there may be the, the way the natural man will respond, the ways and the thoughts of the natural man. But then we go to the Word of God, which teach us the ways and thoughts of God. And then we say, I will intentionally do that because those are the ways and thoughts of God. What happens? We are living by a renewed mind. We are living by a mind that has forsaken the ways and thoughts of, of carnal man and is living by the ways and thoughts of God. Example. Uh, you know, we can think of different situations. Uh, Example, if somebody does evil to me or to you, 
they 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 did they, they you know they may say bad things about you which are untrue and they whatever they try to hurt you now the normal worse way of the world is retaliate give back but then you look to god and god says forgive god says let go so what do you do you choose to take the take on the ways and thoughts of god and say okay god that person is saying all this I'm not going to re retaliate. I'm just going to forgive. I'm just let go, leave it. So you're choosing the ways and thoughts of God. Instead of holding on to unforgiveness or bitterness or anger, you're choosing forgiveness. You're choosing love. You're choosing the ways and thoughts of God. And that is renewing our mind. We are acting aligned to the ways and thoughts of the word of God, what God teaches us. You know, or think about giving. God may speak to your heart, put in your heart saying, give to that person, that person's in need, uh, and I want you to give to that person. And he puts it in your heart. Now in the natural, the immediate reaction is, why should I give, or you know, somebody else can give, or whatever. But then, because God has spoken to you, and God has put it in your heart, it's okay, God, your word says, you know, uh, that when I give, I'm actually sowing seed into, and you will repay, you will multiply those seeds that are sown. When I give, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so you obey God. You give to that person because you are choosing the ways and thoughts of God and not your own. So this is just, you know, like this, there are many, many scenarios where we intentionally choose to live according to the ways and thoughts of God. Right? So in every situation, you operate with a renewed mind. When you face a difficulty, immediately, instead of saying, oh no, this is the end, you say, no, thanks be to God, always causes me to triumph in Christ. When you face something that's pushing you down, you say, you, know, you might think uh, the, the natural response is, oh, I'm defeated. But no, you say, no, I'm born of God, and whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Right. So that's how you, learn to think aligned to the ways and thoughts of God. And as you and I renew our mind, we are able to live out of that new man. We live aligned to the new creation that we are. But on the other hand, if you don't renew our minds, as we see in scripture, Paul calls this as being a carnal mind. You know, that means this is a mind that is given to do things that satisfy the flesh, that don't please God. Uh, it's against the ways of God. And uh, this is when, you know, uh, we, we, we say uh, we have mm, carnally minded believers. That means these, these, they, they are believers. They love, I mean, they've been born again, but they're still living out of their carnal mind. Uh, they have not renewed their mind. And so, you know, they end up doing things that are displeasing to God and that don't truly reflect the new creation life uh, that we have, right? Now, of course, when I say we have to live, you know, from the spirit into the natural, from the spiritual into the natural, from the heavenly into, uh, into the earthly realm or the renewed mind, uh, it doesn't mean that we don't use our mind. And so we have to be spiritually minded, but yet we have to be earthly wise. You know, so, it is held in balance, right? Uh, uh, there are, there's a proper way to live on the earth. Uh, yes, we are spiritual people, but we do have earthly responsibilities. Uh, you know, there are, whether it's in the home or in the school or in the college or in, in just everyday life in the, in the, in, in, in the city, uh, there are certain things, there are certain ways to follow and to live this earthly life. So, we can't just say, you know, I'm, I'm spiritually minded and then uh, abdicate our earthly responsibilities and so on. So it's held in balance. It's, you, we do this right. So wisdom is the ability to take principles of the heavenly realm and apply it correctly to daily life situations in a practical way, right? But that's the first key, right, to living the in Christ life, to live with a renewed mind, to live with a mind that thinks according to the ways and thoughts of God, that lives out of oh, you know, what God has made available to us 
uh, in Christ. We think in line with that, and then we live out of that. Think in line with your identity in Christ. Think in line with your inheritance in Christ, and then live out of that. Okay? Let me pause here and uh, just see if there are any questions or comments people would like to ask. Uh, uh, is this clear so far? Any questions, any comments so far on the first two points that we've covered? Everything okay? Yeah. I trust all of you are following me. All right. Yes, following you. Okay, thank you. Let's move forward. All right. So okay, thank you. I see your comments there in the chat as well. All right. So that's the first thing. Live with a renewed mind. Live with a mind. Train your mind. This is a training process. Train your mind to think aligned to the ways and thoughts of God. Train your mind to think aligned to your identity and your inheritance in Christ. Okay. The second key to living out of the in Christ life, which God has the scriptures teach us is that as believers, we have to walk in the Spirit. We have to be led by the Spirit. And we have to live in the Spirit. Right? So the Holy Spirit, as we know, one of his uh, titles is the Spirit of Christ. He is the Spirit of Christ. And he has come, uh, among, among the many things he does, he has come to transform us into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So one by one spirit, by the Holy Spirit, we are changed into the image of Christ. So he's come to do that, to change us all, to be like Christ, to be in the image of Christ. Important thing is, we have to follow the instructions. We have to be led by the Spirit. We have to be, to live in the Spirit and to walk in the Spirit. So all this simply means that we are living, submitted to His influence, His guidance, His direction. We are living submitted, yielded to the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, He speaks to us. He's with us all the time. He will tell us what is right, what's wrong. He will prompt us. He will influence us. He will guide us from the inside. But we must walk, yielded to Him. We must be willing to let him lead, let him be led by the Spirit. We must live out of his influence, out of his guidance, out of what he brings into our lives. So that's living in the Spirit. And as we do that, what happens? Second Corinthians 3.18 We are transformed into the image of Jesus from glory to glory by the Spirit of the Lord. So what happens as we live yielded to the Holy Spirit? We are changed into that image. That means now we are living out of who we are in Christ and we're becoming like Christ. But that is if we yield to the Holy Spirit. Because He's come to do that. Now, this is something, again, we grow in. It doesn't happen automatically. We learn how to yield to the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit is very gentle in His leading. And there are times when you, know, you will feel the leading of the Holy Spirit very strong. But most of the time, He leads very gently. His words are like whispers. They come very gently, very softly. 
Sometimes people say, oh, I can't hear the Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't mean the Holy Spirit is not speaking. It just means we are too noisy. Our life is, has too much noise with all that's going on, with all that's going on in our minds, that we are just missing out on the whispers of the Holy Spirit because he speaks like that. He speaks very gently, he speaks very softly. There are times when he moves in a very strong way, very powerful way. I'm not denying that. But normally, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the prompting, the guidance, the influence of the Holy Spirit that he gives in our lives is very soft and very gentle. And so, in order to develop sensitivity to the Holy Spirit, we have to become, we have to position ourselves to be in a place of quietness, uh, of calmness, of being, that's where we can become sensitive to his leading, right? And then we live out of that. We live out of his leading. We live out of his teaching. We live out of his guidance. Sometimes he corrects us. Sometimes he, yeah, you know, he may rebuke us. Sometimes he leads us, he prompts us, he motivates us. So many things he does in, 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 in his interactions with us. But we learn to engage and receive from the Holy Spirit and flow with him. And as we do that, we are living out of our life in Christ. Okay? Now, the scriptures, uh, the Apostle Paul, in, in writing to the Colossians, we're going to look at two more passages, Colossians 2 and then in John 15. The Apostle Paul, in talking to the believers at Colossae, uh, highlights these three things in uh, their life in Christ. And so we're going to just look at those three phrases that he uses. This is in Colossians chapter Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. Could somebody please read it for us? Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Amen. Mm. Amen. Could you also read for us from the Amplified Bible, please, Divya? Sure, sure, Pastor. As you have therefore received Christ, even Jesus the Lord, so walk, regulate your lives and conduct and conduct yourselves in union with and conformity to him. Mm -hmm. right. So, notice what Paul is telling us. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord. So this is, okay, now that you received Christ, what next? You received Jesus the Lord. What next? He says, walk in him, Be rooted, and obviously be rooted in him, and built up in him. Right, so we're going to focus on these three. And this will lead us to being established in the faith, as we've been taught, and you can abound in that with thanksgiving. But three things he says to the believer. Walk in him. Be rooted in him. Be built up in him. Right? And as we read from the Amplified, this, this phrase, walk in him, means regulate your lives and conduct yourselves in union with and conformity to him. So what does it mean to walk in him? That means... He's telling us here in Amplified. The Amplified Bible explains it, kind of elaborates on it. So he's saying, to walk in him means you regulate your life. You live in such a way that it is in union with and in conformity to Jesus, to him. So, and of course, this word walk, means go on walking. It, it's it's like, it's an ongoing thing. Right? Present continuous, still our last day on earth. This is how we live. So, 
How should the believer live? You've received Jesus, you're in Christ, wonderful. Continue living in conformity to Him. So, to live this in Christ life, I make a deliberate, intentional choice to live aligned to to the person of Jesus Christ. I live in conformity to who He is, to what He would do. So that's one very important thing. I make a deliberate choice to do that. So, just like how Jesus lived out of the, His union with the Father, so Jesus, like we said earlier, Jesus was on earth, Father is in heaven, but his life on earth was lived in conformity to or in union with the Father. He never said or did anything that was out of you know, uh, the Father's will or out of character with the Father. So that to the point where Jesus could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. You know, uh, that's a very, very powerful thing to say. If you've heard me, you've heard the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Meaning, this is how I'm living. I'm completely aligned to the Father. I'm just doing what He wants me to do. And that's how the believer is supposed to live. In conformity to, aligned to, in union with Jesus. So how can I live my life in Christ? Well, live in conformity to Him. Live aligned to Him. Live out of that union with Him. So, you know, in uh, every aspect of our lives, you know, our daily conduct, and, and I've given some scriptures here that talk about, you know, our, our, our conduct in Christ. That means how you live your everyday life. Uh, Paul writes, verse 28, 6, you know, through whom we live, we live out of Him. So our daily conduct flows out of our union with Christ. So Lord, if this is how, if this is how Jesus will do it, I'm going to do it. If this is how Jesus will speak, I'm going to speak like that. If this is how Jesus will treat this person, I'm going to treat this person like that. If this is what Jesus will not do, I will not do it. What are we doing? Our conduct, the way we live, is coming out of that place of union with Christ. It's coming out of conformity and alignment to who Jesus is. So walk in Him. In fact, you'll find many more scriptures you know, uh, that deal with our social life, meaning so here in First Corinthians 7, he says who he was called in the Lord as a slave. So this person is actually slave, but now he is in the Lord. You know, or uh, um, he says, you know, so even that, that what your social standing is now is in the Lord. Conduct, conduct yourself, even if you're a slave, conduct yourself like the Lord's, as you you know somebody who's been set by free by the Lord, but you know maybe in the social standing you're still a slave or you're in submission to somebody or wife and husband you know do it in the Lord you know uh, uh, the relationship with man and woman in the Lord the relationship between children and parents in the Lord wives and husbands in the Lord so you know and I just mentioned these scriptures here but what Paul is telling us is, look, even our social, even our relationships with people is coming out of our place in the Lord. It's in that context that we carry out these relationships. So like I said earlier, we make a deliberate choice. How will Jesus treat this person? How will Jesus speak to this person? I will do it like that. We are walking in Him. We are walking in accordance to out of our union with and in conformity to who Jesus is. Now that's a choice we make. It's a deliberate choice. 
And as we do that, we are living out of our life in Christ. And then in that same passage of scripture, Colossians 2, 7, which we read, Paul continued, be rooted, rooted in him. So now he is uh, using a different picture. He's using the picture of a tree with the roots, you know, and, um, and, and he's saying, let your roots be in him, in Christ. Now we know, you know, this is just common knowledge that uh, the root uh, is what brings uh, the root system. It's what brings strength uh, to the tree. And then it also provides the supply uh, of uh, food and nutrients to the tree. Right? So basically, Paul is saying, be rooted in Christ. That means your root system, your strength and your supply are coming through Jesus Christ. Okay, be rooted in Christ. So, you know, I generally say, like, yeah, don't be rooted in some person or some denomination or some church. Be rooted in Jesus Christ. Now, these things have its place, you know. Uh, God has placed people in the body to teach and minister and so on. And God has, there are local churches that we are all part of and there are believers with whom we all relate and all that is good. But our roots have to be in the person of Jesus Christ. Ultimately, that's where our roots are. It's not in, a, not in any other person or other denomination or church. Or, no, it's in the person of Jesus Christ. So be rooted in him. Practically, how do we do this? Uh, we keep our eyes on Jesus. Right? Keep your eyes on Jesus, not on people. People are there. Good, we can learn from each other. We can be encouraged by leaders and preachers and all of that. But our eyes are fixed on Jesus. Then develop your relationship with Jesus. So see, the root is talking about some strong relationship. Develop your relationship with Jesus. You spend time with him. And then depend on Jesus. Right? Because strength comes. It's the roots, the roots go in, they pull out the nutrients, they you know, bring the water, etc., from the soil for the tree. That means it's you're drawing from Jesus. You're depending on him. So practically, this is what we do. So to live out of my life in Christ, Paul is telling us, be rooted in Jesus. And then you'll be able to live out of you, out of him. Your eyes are on him. You're developing close relationship with him. You're depending on him. You will eventually live out your life from him. So Paul says, now that you receive Jesus as the Lord, walk in him, be rooted in him. Him. The reason many believers fail to live out of their identity and inheritance in Christ is because their roots are not in Him. You know, they're kind of plugged into something else. Maybe their preacher, maybe their denomination, maybe their local church thing. You know, okay, those those things have their place, but our roots have to be in Jesus. So. Keep that in mind and, and, and focus on that. I'm going to pause here. We will take our quick 10-minute break and come back. We'll take up any questions, and uh, then we will move forward the rest of the points. Uh, any questions so far? Okay. Um, we will go for a break right now and uh, we will come back and we will finish this and then we will do a quick review of the full course so that we get a full picture of what, what we have learned 
in this course. Okay, uh, we'll see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you.